United Special Envoy says he is encouraged by the intensified international diplomacy to end the conflict in Yemen. African migrants pose security threats to Shabba government. Houthis infect generations of youth minds with their sectarian education. Good evening. Welcome to Yemen Today TV. I'm Abir Ali and you're watching the English News. The Yemeni government called on the international community to exert more pressure on the Houthi group. Yemeni's representative to the United Nations, Mohammed Asadi, in the speech before the Security Council, called for finding a new approach to confront Houthi intransigence. He said that the interception of Iranian weapons smuggled to the Houthis confirms the group's preparation for a new round to conflict. He added that the Houthis militia must be deterred and included in the terrorist groups. Asadi accused the Houthi militia of harassing Yemeni women in the manner of terrorist organizations in the refer to the strict restrictions imposed by the group on women in the areas under their control. The United Nations Special Envoy briefed the United Nations Security Council on the latest development in Yemen. Amid his visit to Sana'a, he expressed his hope that there is a new path for peace in the country. This report has more. UN Security Council held a meeting to discuss the situation in Yemen. Hans Grunberg talked about the discussions he had with regional countries and parties to the conflict to help end the war in Yemen. Despite the efforts made by the international community, there are still many obstacles that make it hard to reach a peace agreement in Yemen, including the Houthis' negative behavior to be included in any peace talks. I call on the parties to respect international humanitarian law. Military activity combined with negative rhetoric and escalatory political and economic measures, create a situation where a simple miscalculation could reignite the cycle of violence that will, ha that will be difficult to reverse. I therefore urge the parties to actively work to extend the longest period of relative quiet we have seen in the past eight years, which offers a much needed reprieve for the Yemeni population. The Houthis took control of the capital Sana'a in Yemen back in 2014, resulting in the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe, a UN-backed truce which took effect in April 2022 and ended on October 2, raised hopes for a longer pause in fighting, but unfortunately it ended after six months of its start. Mr. Grumber called on a long-term or a permanent solution for the conflict in Yemen, rather than focusing on temporary solutions that bring temporary relief. We know from experience, however, that short-term measures and a piecemeal approach that focuses on individual issues can only provide temporary and partial relief. This is why I have also been engaging the parties on embedding these immediate-term measures in a more holistic vision and ensuring movement towards a more comprehensive settlement. This includes the resumption of a political process and a nationwide ceasefire. We are currently seeing an intensification of regional and international diplomatic activity to resolve the conflict in Yemen. The meeting was also attended by UN humanitarian chief Martin Griffiths, who talked about how the situation in 2023 could continue to be extremely difficult for Yemenis due to many factors, including the country's economy. I, of course, also fear that 2023 will be another extremely difficult year for the people of Yemen. Humanitarian needs remain alarmingly high as the country's economy continues to weaken and basic services hang by a thread. Meanwhile, people's access to humanitarian assistance is being impeded as aid agencies are forced to contend with the increasingly challenging operating environment, as well as a funding landscape, which does not encourage. Mr. President, in 2023, this year, an estimated 21.6 million people across Yemen will need humanitarian assistance and protection services, and it is precisely because this is such a high percentage of the total population of Yemen that the United Nations has for so long talked about the humanitarian crisis in Yemen as being the worst that we see globally. 
Finally, the UN envoy Hans Grumberg concluded the UN Security Council meeting by urging the parties to move quickly towards a shared vision with concrete, actionable steps. Yemen needs an agreement that includes a shared vision for the way forward in order to avoid a return to full-blown conflict. I therefore urge the parties to make the most of the space for dialogue provided by the absence of large-scale fighting. I would also like to reiterate my sincere appreciation for the steadfast support of this Council. The world community, and more importantly, the conflicting parties, must not allow this opportunity to pass them by. In addition, they must back the UN's call for humanitarian aid and step up their efforts to strengthen Yemen's economy and help end the conflict in Yemen. France announced that it will make an additional contribution of 1 million euros to the United Nations rescue plan for the Safra oil tanker. The additional contribution raises France's total contribution to 2.26 million euros. Inta's government forces have engaged in confrontations with the Houthi militia during the past hours. The confrontations focused on the north and west of the city, where government forces repelled Houthi fire sources targeting their positions. The government forces thwarted in an infiltration attempt by the Houthi militia in conjunction with clashes with the medium weapons in Hathran to the west. Shabwa government hosts thousands of African migrants. Those migrants have become a security burden on the local authority as they should ensure their safety. This report has more. On a daily basis, dozens of illegal migrants come from the Horn of Africa who continue to flow to Shabwa government through the coasts of Rodden district, where smuggling gangs drop them off and then local smugglers transport them to the city of Atak, in which they take it as a settlement point. The security authorities in the government also expressed their concern about the heavy presence of African migrants, stressing that this spread contributed to the high crime rate and the spread of prostitution and drugs. Actually, there are many African migrants here which force us to take care of security measures as they need huge residential camps in addition to securing the movements. Many African migrants settled in this government and they rented so many places in Altaq and they usually gain money through illegal means. 
With the increasing prevalence of African immigrants in the city of Atak, a state of fear prevailed among the population, as this poses economic burdens and serious health and security risks to them. African migrants constitute a state of disturbance to the residents of Ata, and a lot of crimes have been committed by them. I suggest specifying a camp for them so that the movements can be limited. Popular demands called on the government, local authorities and the competent authorities in the government read to develop a security and health strategy towards the continued influx of African migrants in a manner that guarantees the removal from the city and the establishment of special camps for them under the government's supervision to reduce the risks of their continuous presence. How these continue to infect minds of generations of young people by imposing their religious propaganda the reports have included major amendments in the school curriculum. Such amendments serve their Iranian sectarian agenda. This report gives more details. The conflict has a devastating impact on education. It is a key factor in limiting access to quality education and has a negative impact on the mental health and productivity of children and youth. It also breaks down social cohesion and increases inequalities. However, one area of understanding conflict impacts has shifted from viewing conflict as an obstacle to providing education to more of an understanding of a subtle and profound disturbing linkage. Educational practices that promote cultural repression and manipulate culture and history to serve political goals can generate violence and reinforce inequality. Recently, the health has introduced new changes to the school textbooks taught in primary education in areas under their control. The changes express their ideological, religious, and political views. During conflicts, education is forcefully politicized and teachers, schools, and students become weapons and targets of war. Houthis have deployed education to reinforce both their identity and legitimacy. Since the outbreak of the 2015 conflict, when the Saudi-led coalition announced its war against the group, the changes introduced to school textbooks in areas under the healthy control serve to deepen faith identity and reinforce claims of fighting Western imperialism and its regional and local puppets. Additionally, the healthies are forcing certain practices in schools such as prohibiting gender mixing and the replacement of entertainment songs with healthy slogans and religious chorales and hymens. The new changes reflect political and ideological ambitions to shape a public and political order that normalizes violence and conflict and to legitimize the ideological and political vision of the Houthis. School textbooks represent the foremost form of societal beliefs transmitters. They are used as mass interference between an authority's acceptable culture and students. Textbooks are considered authoritative and factual. Politically influenced education is often exclusionary, as it fails to represent different collective national identities. Political mobilization through education can promote social division and eventually violence against certain groups and increase structural violence, in which unequal, repressive and racist forces are in the structures of society. Violence is not a normal response to disagreement, but it is generated and manipulated by elites who have the power to reform educational systems. Coming up in the news. Yemen's famous artifacts are looted and smuggled during the time of war.
طبعا هناك حماس صراحة من المزارعين وجمعية شوبع نسبة الزيادة في الإنتاج قد تكون 99% Welcome back. In Aden, the second medical camp for mental illnesses was held. The camp aims to help patients cope with the war trauma. The following report gives more details. As the economic health and living conditions in Yemen deteriorate, especially for patients who suffer from mental disorders, the interim capital of Aden today witnessed the inauguration of the second free medical camp for mental and neurological conditions. This camp is held by the National Program for Mental and Neurological Health in cooperation with the Teaching Psychiatric and Neurological Diseases Hospital. This camp was inaugurated at the time when the Yemeni population was suffering from an influx of mental conditions. We would like to thank pharmaceutical companies for their contribution, especially considering how expensive medication tends to be. Among those who arrived at the medical camp to benefit from the free services is Um Ziyad, an elderly woman whose son was diagnosed over four years ago. My son is sick. He has been suffering from excess electricity in the body for four or five years. His condition has not responded to any medicine. On top of that, I suffer from a cardiovascular disease and I need about six thousand dollars for treatment. The camp will operate and provide its humanitarian services for patients for a total of five days, offering inspection services and providing free medication to patients, especially expensive medications that families cannot afford. Patients from all government rates are eligible for free medicine. The majority of people cannot afford medicines because of poor economic conditions. We established this camp to assist persons suffering from mental and psychiatric diseases, and we seek to alleviate people's struggles. We've set up camps in the past, and this won't be our last one. It is our duty to support patients who struggle with psychological and mental disorders, as well as other ailments such as high cholesterol and pressure and cardiovascular diseases. The staff and those in charge of this camp, which is gaining more and more attention every day, offer a variety of medical services and humanitarian endeavors. This makes it necessary for the relevant authorities, owners of pharmaceutical companies, and philanthropists to work together and continue supporting such initiatives. The director of the Office of the General Authority for Antiques and Evians Government warned that the government's museum was suspected during the past years to large extent of damage. He said that the museum contained many pavilions for displaying ancient antiques, in addition to many rare holdings that are most than a thousand years old. He added that most of those artifacts were looted or smuggled. This report has more. In Yemen, the cultural losses have gone largely unnoted by the wider world, but are keenly felt by archaeologists. Although the country has been far less solid than Mesopotamia, it played a critical role in the rise of empires and economies in the region starting around 1000 BC. More than 80 historical sites and monuments have been destroyed. That number count the Sana'a's entire old city as one site wholesale, as well as the old city of Sada, which is also recognized by UNESCO and has endured heavy bombing. Yemen is cited by many as a birthplace of Arab civilization, home to the biblical queen of Sheba. It has also been the most fertile part of the Arabian Peninsula, separated from its desert neighbors by a range of volcanic mountains. The growing list of damaged and destroyed sites now includes the historic centers of Sada Ma'rib al Jawf and the early medieval city of Zabid, another UNESCO World Heritage Site, as well as monuments like the 12th century Al Qahira Citadel in Taiz, which was restored by UNESCO. Smuggling antiquities is another challenge. The smuggling process is a scenario that hasn't been stopped. Yemeni many workers in the antiquities sector accused the Houthi rebels of systematic destruction of national artifacts through smuggling, trading, bombing, and using the museums as military barracks. Last year, Yemeni officials accused the group of smuggling and looting over 14,000 rare Yemeni manuscripts and hundreds of artifacts. 
The artifacts were sent to other countries after they were stolen from museums and archaeological sites. In areas under the militia's control, the government called on European countries to prevent commercial agencies from selling Yemeni antiquities, which belong only to the Yemeni people. Here is a reminder of the main headlines. United Nations Special Envoy says he is encouraged by intensified international diplomacy to the end of conflict in Yemen. African migrants pose security threats to Shabwagama rats. Houthis infect generations of youth minds with their sectarian education. This is the end of the news. It was Abir Ali and thank you for watching.